Let us pray today because I believe the Lord has a word for his people. And today we're looking at the topic, Touch by a Child, a Carpenter's Response. Let us ask God's blessing. Lord, even now we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercies. And Lord, in a special way, we ask that you will speak to our hearts, speak to our minds. Lord, I give you the glory today because this is the best my voice has been uh, since this week. And I've been praying and I thank you for touching my voice and I pray that you'll give me the strength to proclaim your word with power and with clarity. But in the interim too, I pray that you'll hide me and allow your people to see and to hear your voice and to see you in Christ's name. Amen. Now, just before I speak, I just want, you know, we, we had a warm welcome this morning. But I'm going to ask you just to turn to the person beside you. Just turn to the person beside you and say, God loves you. And so do I. I don't think some people heard that. Can you just say it again? God loves you. And so do I. And can you give that person the brightest smile that you can conjure? Don't worry if you didn't brush your teeth this morning. Uh, give them the brightest smile. If your teeth is yellow, that's okay. But we just want them to know, that person beside you, to know that they, you are loved, that they are cared for, and that you've come to the right place. Because in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. Now, let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 and verses 18 to 20. Matthew chapter 1 and verses 18 to 20. I know that we are approaching uh, the Christmas season. In fact, we're in the season right now. You're seeing decorations going all over. It's a point of, of contact for Christians, uh, a particular Seventh-day Adventists, for us to, to, to lift up the name of Jesus during this season because this is a powerful time when the hearts and minds of many are drawn towards Jesus Christ, and we have to make use of this time to glorify our Lord and our Savior. And I believe that today God has a message for us through uh, this word. And in the passage, the Bible says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, oftentimes, during this uh, Christmas period, we will hear many sermons about Mary. And I love Mary, and I've preached on Mary. In fact, when you think about Mary, her name elicits tender sentiments of a mother's love and affection to her newborn. But there is a name that is oftentimes overlooked, not preached on, and sometimes forgotten. And in my opinion, this individual is of great importance in a narrative in this word. And I wish I could do enough justice in this message today in acknowledging the role of this figure, but I'll just allow God to work in his time and what he has given. I'm just going to share, but I wish we could do a little bit more study upon this individual. And I'm looking at this man called, named Joseph carpenter and this man i've shared is touch was touched by a child and we're going to see now the carpenter's response now for me growing up i did not have much experience at carpentry in fact in high school we had woodworks class and that's about the only thing i ever did in carpentry did some simple designs there but i was fortunate while in jamaica pastoring to see some carpenters busy at work and oftentimes they worked alone unless they worked with a team or for a company. 
And one of the things you'll oftentimes notice when carpenters are with carpenters is that they mostly work in silence. You see, as they manipulate the wood and shape it to precision, uh, their focus is on making sure everything is just right. So they, they, they have to eliminate all distractions from their minds. You see, their tools are usually sharp and their margin for error slim. And so their mind is riveted upon getting it right. Their ability to work in silence can be deafening for some. But for them, it is like a symphony. Joseph in scripture, like his trade bespeaks, was a silent man. Now I've searched and I've not found a single word said by this man in scripture. And it occurred to me that he may have been mute. But since the Bible does not describe him in that manner, I will omit it. But nevertheless conclude with the thought, he was a man of few words. I believe he fell in line with the pattern of most men in society, the silent type. This is a type that can drive some women crazy. But if you can read the body language and actions of a silent man, you may best appreciate his inner world. Joseph was a carpenter by trade, and uh, for most Jews, it was important to know a trade alongside your profession, which is why the Apostle Paul, though a learned scholar by profession, was also a tent maker by trade. Let me just speak, and I hope you can respond. If, 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 the, if the message gets to you, it's okay to say amen. It's okay to say hallelujah, because the glory is not coming to me, it's going to God. So I just want to ensure that you're hearing God's word. You know, it's okay. It is okay to have a skill. There is no dishonor in knowing a skill or having a trade behind you. This is what makes you rounded in this world. Now hear me out. Book knowledge is good. Book knowledge is good, but there comes a time when you need to know how to do something with your hands. And I know I'm, I'm, I'm coming from a tradition where uh, in high school, I said to my father, I want to do something. I want to go to a technical school. And my father said, no, 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 no. You're not going to do what I did growing up because he was a welder. He said, no, you, you, you're going to go to the other school. You're going to learn. And, and, and we had a disagreement there. But that was a mentality that many people still have where we say we don't want you to have a trade. But understand, it is a good thing to have a trade beside you. Doesn't matter if you're a doctor or a lawyer, knowing something with your hand is good. And the trade of a carpenter in Joseph's time was, was not the most sought after work, especially being a carpenter in a provincial village like Nazareth. It was a very humble position which turned in a low to moderate salary. Uh, nothing is really mentioned of Joseph's early life in scripture. We can only speculate that he may have been married before, and his previous wife may have passed away, as is the reference made to Jesus' brothers and sisters in Luke chapter 8 and verse 19 and Matthew 12 and verse 46. Now, we don't know how many, if any, of those brothers and sisters were actually Mary's children after Christ's birth. What we do know, however, was that this quiet carpenter was pledged to be married to Mary. Now, to be espoused or, or betrothed meant that after a legal exchange of goods or valuables between the parents, there would be a time as much as a year before they were married. So they were pledged to be married. However, the law saw them as husband and wife, and the only way to get out of it was through a divorce. To cheat on a partner during the betrothal state was seen as adultery. So Joseph was engaged to Mary, and he was apparently looking forward to the union. And it's at this point in Joseph's lives that he was about to be touched by a child. How was he touched? Mary came to him and gave an announcement. Came to him and said, hey, Joseph, I have some news for you. I can't wait to tell you. And Joseph said, go ahead. Well, I, I wanted to share with you, Joseph, that, that I'm pregnant. <laughs> I can't just imagine Joseph now having this conversation. Say what? 
Yes, Joseph, I, I, I'm pregnant. Isn't that good news? No, it's not. <laughs> who are you pregnant for? Come on now. Who are you pregnant for? Because it wasn't with me. You don't understand, Joseph. I'm still a virgin. I've never known a man. Now, at this point, you know, if, if somebody is having this conversation with you, you probably start to think, is something right here? <laughs> is everything okay? And she began to continue. You see, there was this angel named Gabriel. So the man's name is Gabriel, eh? <laughs> That's the fellow. Huh? No, 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 no. Gabriel is an angel. And he shared that I would have a child and his name would be Jesus. For he would be the Messiah we have long waited for. Uh, don't you believe me, Joseph? And I'm sure those words just went right over Joseph's head. And believe me, friends, um, don't worry. Most of us would not believe Mary with that story. But I want to pause here. You see, one of the worst emotions to feel is that of betrayal. If you've ever trusted someone and they go behind your back and cheat on you, it feels like a dagger being thrust in your stomach and then twisted to cause as much damage as possible. So understand what Joseph is feeling right now. To hear those words coming from the lips of Mary was not eliciting joy in him. It brought out pain. But the way Joseph deals with his grief, because he's grieving right now, the way he deals with it is commendable. Nowhere do we hear him shouting at her and verbally abusing her. And I want to just hit the men here. Please listen to me, men. Hear me out. At this point, Joseph thought she cheated on him. Yet we don't hear of him assaulting her and giving her a smack down. I've heard men share what they would do if they found out their partner was cheating. But we don't read of Joseph, who's a carpenter by trade, taking out a chisel or a knife and coming back up to carve her up. You see, saints, this should have been a violent encounter. A violent chapter in scripture. But Joseph holds his tongue. He holds his peace. And like a carpenter in the workshop, he goes into stealth mode, into silent mode. But watch his actions, for his action speaks louder than the words. The Bible says in verse 19, that Joseph, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. So he did not want to make her a public example. Joseph did not want to embarrass Mary. He was hurting. Please remember, he's hurting inside. He's hurting. You better believe it. But instead of seeking vengeance, instead of getting back at her and cheating with someone else, instead of sharing this news as gossip to everyone in town, he retreated from her presence to think and to meditate, to ponder his next move. He would divorce her without fanfare and depart in peace. If Joseph was a Pharisee, and I dare say we have Pharisees right here in the church as well. Maybe not here at Lawrenceville Church, but we have Pharisees all over. If Joseph was a Pharisee, Mary would have been stoned to death, banished, and surely hated by the community. The whole world would have known about her business. And this is one reason why I respect this man right here. Possibly later that night as a carpenter wrestled in his sleep, pondering if he was doing the right thing, an angel appeared unto him. Praise be to God. You see, I'm glad that God will not leave his people in ignorance. I'm glad that he hears and comforts the brokenhearted. 
It doesn't matter how hot the pain feels inside your heart. I'm here to tell you that God is able to soothe that spirit. And God reached out to this broken vessel to pacify Joseph's wrath. Note, however, when the angel appeared, it wasn't earlier while Joseph was talking to Mary. Because it would have been much easier had Mary been speaking and all of a sudden the angel appeared and then Joseph said, you're right, I could see what you're talking about. No, no, no. God waited. Why did God wait to send uh, this angel, Gabriel again, to this man Joseph? Why did God wait? God was showing us the character of this man. His character was on display for the world to see. This was a test of who Joseph was made of or what he was made up of. Joseph could have hurt Mary with his words. He could have physically assaulted her and Christ in the womb. Imagine if he punched Mary in the womb. The end, that would have been the end of Christ's life. But here he held his peace. Blessed is the man that can be angry and sin not. Ephesians 4 and verse 26. And this goes for women as well. This goes for the ladies as well. Blessed is he who can be angry. It's okay to be angry. It's, it's okay when somebody betrays you to be angry. But blessed are you when you can be angry and sin not. And I can see why the Heavenly Father made the decision in choosing Joseph. The angel told him in verse 20. Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived in her, Joseph, is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, and it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. And shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which be interpreted is God with us. And then verse 24, and I love it. The Bible says, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. Basically, immediately, Joseph took her to be his wife. Now, he's a man of few words. But he's a man of conviction and action. If God says it for a Joseph, I believe it. Joseph was quick to listen and quick to obey. For some of us, God has to arm wrestle us and twist us to do his will. When God gives us testimonies and dreams, we sometimes still refuse to follow him. But take a page out of Joseph's book. When you know the way, the truth, and the life, follow him. Now there are three things I want to quickly highlight about this carpenter named Joseph in this narrative. Three things. As a carpenter, Joseph understood, one, life will not always be perfect, though you strive for it. Life will not always be perfect, though you strive for it. Let's dig into that. You see, a carpenter strives for perfection in his or her work. As Joseph worked in his shop as a carpenter, he's hoping that the legs of the table will be even. He's praying that the tabletop will be leveled and the, the rough edges smooth. And Joseph applied this to his life. He did it the right way. He would do things the right way. For a carpenter has to be disciplined in his focus and in his work. You see, he communicated with Mary's parents about his intent to have their daughter to be his wife. He was going to do it the right way. He provided the proper gifts because marriage is an investment. Come on now. And today, you better believe, even though we don't give gifts to our parents and such, marriage is still an investment. He had ample opportunity, listen to me now, he had ample opportunity to sleep with her before the time he didn't. He was going to wait. Mm. Had he done this before, the story would have been different. For Joseph, everything was going perfect. He would do it to his very best. And according to plan, until Jesus came along. Touched by a child. Here was an unwanted pregnancy. 
an unwanted child in his midst. And I want to share with you that life can throw you monkey wrenches. And for Joseph, this was one. Jesus was a monkey wrench in his life. Jesus broke up his so-called perfect life, his perfect narrative, and brought about a strange twist to his story. Joseph knew as a carpenter, however, that no matter how hard one works, there would still be imperfections in his work. No two legs would be perfectly even. No tabletop would be impervious to fall. And as he accepted his imperfection with this craft, he also accepted imperfections in others. So Joseph gave room for Mary to be imperfect. And didn't hurt her for being so. He gave room for the child to stay alive as it was not the child's fault for coming about imperfectly. He gave room for God to clear things up. That's why he went to meditate and to pray on these things. He gave room for himself to see things better because he understood that he himself was not perfect. He counted his loss and knew that life was not always perfect. Secondly, Joseph knew as a carpenter that you have to work with what you have. You have to do what? You have to work with what you have. Now, every carpenter knows that he or she has to be resourceful. When things don't work out, you sometimes have to improvise. You have to make it work. You have to make it fit. You have to make it match. And after the angel showed him the truth, he knew this wasn't exactly how he planned his life. But he was now willing to work with it. He didn't want a child now, but he would have to make it work. He didn't want the responsibility to be the father of the Messiah, but he had to make it work. Life is tough, friends. Life comes at you fast. But the ability to push through with what you have and succeed is a quality that we all need to possess. So you didn't learn to read and write till later on in life. It's tough, but make it work. Your last marriage didn't work out. You can either sit and sulk all day or accept the fact and move on. Your business partner stole the funds that you invested. It's tough, but you now have to move on. Sometimes things in life that you've planned for perfectly doesn't come to fruition. But God is saying there's a way you now have to move on. Don't just stay at one place and mourn all day with weeping and, and, and wailing. God says take away the, 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 the ashes from you and put on some, some beauty on you. Put on something, rub your face, or wash your face, look alive. It's time to work with your situation. For Joseph... Moving on with Jesus meant that he would be ridiculed till thy kingdom come. His friends would constantly tease him. And in Jamaica, we'd say, brother, you have a jacket. That means you have an illegitimate child. Your wife burnt you, man. <laughs> this wasn't what he wanted. But he sucked it up and moved ahead. You can't work with excuses. A carpenter can't give excuses for why the work isn't done. The carpenter has to push through and work with what he has. Thirdly, every carpenter knows that comes what may, you have to finish the task. You have to finish the task. Now, it was a joy for my wife and I early in our marriage. We were ministering in Jamaica in St. Thomas District. It was a privilege uh, for us to, to, to order a dining room table. It was the first time we went to order something and, and, and order a design, and they were going to work on it from scratch. And we wanted a dining room table that was oval in design with a glass centerpiece and pedestal legs. And so we were excited. And every week I would, I would drive by just to glimpse them at work at this table. 
And sure enough, they were busy. And then a few days later, they, they called us and, and said, come on in and, and look at it. And we stood in awe, admiring this masterpiece. Through sweat and blood, the carpenter produced the work. And my wife stood and just admired the table. But, but when I looked at the carpenter, I think he admired it more. There was a pride in the carpenter to know that what he has done was accepted by those who are purchasing it. You see, for the carpenter, a carpenter works diligently to finish his task. Now, please stay with me now. Joseph was going to be the best father he could for this baby. And at this moment, just like Mary, his fatherly instinct was kicking in as Mary's um, motherly instincts was kicking in. And for a father, a father wants to provide security for his family. And he was going to protect Jesus comes what may. He had to finish this task. So when he made his way to Bethlehem to pay his taxes, he didn't leave Mary behind. You see, if he had a hard time accepting Mary's story. His family surely did not accept her story. And he didn't trust Mary with them. So he said, Mary, though the journey is hard and you're heavy with child, you're coming with me. I have to protect you and that child. When Herod wanted to kill Jesus, he took him and fled to Egypt as a refugee. Did you hear that? Your Messiah was a refugee. Mm. How do we treat refugees? And he settled in Nazareth eventually. And the last we hear of him was when Jesus was 12 and was led into the temple. Now Joseph came and with Mary, because they, they had lost Jesus for those three days. And when they found Jesus, they were happy. But, but it was G Mary who said to Jesus, what have you done? Didn't you know that we were looking for you? Come on, you can't do it. It was Mary. But this man of few words, didn't say a word. He was simply joyful to have found his son and looked forward to what he would become. You see, for Joseph, he had to finish his task, which was to protect Jesus. So when he lost Jesus for three days, you can imagine his heart is beating. He's now anxious. He said, man, I, I, I failed. I failed at my task. And now he has found you. He couldn't even say a word. He was just so happy to see Jesus and embraced him. Now allow me a few words. By the time Jesus was baptized at 30, Joseph had died. But here's a contrast. Jesus, Joseph was a lowly carpenter in Nazareth. But Jesus, at the age of 12, when brought into the temple with these, with these great uh, philosophers and teachers of the law, was himself a mighty teacher and philosopher. At the age of 12, he humbled these men. And they were saying to Mary and Joseph, you got to keep him here. Please, this guy is, this young boy is smart. And we want to train him as a leader. But they said, no, he's coming with us. But watch this. Jesus, the son of God, honored his earthly father by becoming a carpenter by trade as well. Now, no parent ought to force their child into being someone they're not. So it's, it's noteworthy. It's really noteworthy when a child walks in the footsteps of his or her parent. And Jesus honored Joseph by choosing to be like him. He could have been a professor somewhere. He said, no, I'm going to be a carpenter like you. By diligently helping his dad lift the heavy furniture and understanding the dynamic intricacies of carving wood, he honored his earthly father in this manner until his heavenly father said, it's time for your public ministry. Jesus learned a thing or two from his silent carpenter father. Life will not always be perfect, though you strive for it. 
understand that Jesus could do nothing about his parents. Some of us say, I, I wish I had different parents. It doesn't matter how much you wish. You can't change who your parents are. Jesus worked with what he had. His parents did not have formal education. That's still no excuse. He worked with what he had. Jesus could not change his zip code. He worked with what he had. And some of us say, because of where I'm coming from, I can't succeed. Not so in scripture. It doesn't matter your zip code. You can succeed because God's grace is upon you. I had the privilege of, of, of having a president at my old university who said when he was growing up, going to school, he sometimes in primary school, he went to school barefooted. And in high school, when he was talking, trying to talk to a young lady near the cafeteria, uh, he mistakenly places his, his, the, the sole of his feet, foot up. And basically, there were holes and gaps in his shoes. And some young boys saw him and laughed him to scorn until he was so ashamed, he, he just ran away. And he didn't basically, he said, you know, he, he couldn't read and write until he was about 15, 14. That's when he really started to grasp what he was looking at. But that still was no excuse for him. And eventually he kept at it. Don't you, str you have to strive. It doesn't matter if life doesn't, it throws you curveballs. You must strive. And he kept on striving until he became the president of the university. And when he spoke, this man who could not read and, and write till at 15, when he spoke, people would just pause and listen with awe. Oh! And it's not about him. It's about what God can do through you and in you if you don't give up and give in. Life will not always be perfect, though you strive for it. So guess what Jesus did? He strives for perfection, but he chose 12 imperfect men to follow him. They had defects and they had flaws. But he says, I'm going to be patient with them. For he taught them perfectly, yet they learned imperfectly. Jesus learned from his father that a carpenter has to work with what you have. So Jesus was willing to put up with their faulty understanding and slow reasoning. He was willing to associate with the sinful and take them as they are and lead them to where they needed to be. He takes what we give him and he says, come, I'll work with what you have you have to work with what you have and thirdly jesus learned from his father his earthly father that you have to finish the task when jesus understood at the age of 12 in the temple the desire of ages ellen white says that that's the time when he looked at the sacrifices and the lamb during a Passover, that's when he realized that he would be the lamb slain for his people. That's the time he said, I, I, I'm committing to this task. But there came a point in his life, in dark Gethsemane, when Jesus said to his heavenly father, please take this cup from me. I'm tired. Father, some of these individuals who I'm willing to die for, they're still going to reject me. And some will serve me half-hearted. I'm tired. But maybe he remembered his earthly father. A carpenter must finish the task. And Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Walking the dusty road of Golgotha, they made a mistake with Jesus. They laid a cross on his back. What's the cross made of? Wood. Jesus is a carpenter. Once the wood touched him and he remembered now the feel of a wood in the carpenter shop. He understood that just as this wood was still rough, he had a work to do to perfect this sacrifice. 
He had to go and finish the job at the cross. But I, I want to bring you to a point now. Because when Jesus was hanging upon the cross, Jesus said an eternal word, our words. He said, it is finished. I looked up that word, finish. And it basically said, it's marked by the highest quality. And it's used by carpenters or workmen to say, a finished job of quality. So Jesus and the cross was using a carpenter's definition of finishing a job to perfection. On the cross, he said, the job is finished of the highest grade and quality. You can't do better than what I have done on this cross. I have finished the task, my father. You see, Jesus had to deliver the finished product to the heavenly father. And Jesus was saying, Father, this sacrifice is unblemished. It's perfect in every dimension. I have fulfilled what you required. God, it is done. It is finished. Now, I come to the close. You see, Jesus finishes what he begins. But I have a question for you. And as you play. Have you allowed this carpenter Jesus. A moment in your life. To bring you to completion. Now the thing with a carpenter is that when they have a piece of wood. They're going to sand that wood down. Are you willing to allow Jesus to sand you down a little? He knows the spots in our lives that, that is uneven. And when he comes, when, this, when we are touched by this man, touched by this child, he's going to start a work in us that sometimes will feel painful. It's not according to our plan. But he has a plan for you. He may have to chip off some rough edges in our lives. But I can guarantee you this. Jesus will not discard of you. He won't give up on you. Because a carpenter knows how to work with what he or she has. Today you may say, I have nothing worthwhile to give you, God. But he says, come as you are and the beautiful thing is as you come as you are to him he's gonna take his time to work with you and in you the Bible tells us that it is God who works in us to bring about his will in our lives but the preceding verse found in Philippians I believe is 2 chapter 2 the preceding verse says that you must work out your personal salvation with trembling and fear. So there's something that we must do. And like the carpenter there, we have to pause and say, what have life thrown at me? Instead of making excuses now and say, I, I, didn't, I didn't grow up in this family or I grew up in this neighborhood and it wasn't the best and this is why I am the way I am. Instead of making excuses, you look at your situation, you measure it and you say, this is what I have, this is what I'm going to work with. But God is saying, when you come to that position of saying, I'm going to work on this in my life, you're not the only one working. God says, I too am working in you to bring about what I want in your life. 
you may say I only have one talent that's all God wants just come I refer back to that humble man named Joseph he was not eloquent we don't hear of him speaking at all all he had was a skill in scripture that of a carpenter and that's all God wanted of him come with what you have and Joseph took this man who was not known God took this man who was not known in Israel he was just a lowly carpenter and God elevated him that every year around this period his name is mentioned so God is looking at you and you and you and he's looking at me and he's saying if you come with that one little talent that you have don't look at your neighbor and compare yourself with him just come with that one talent just come to me I know how to work it in such a way that others will be blessed by your presence if today you just want to say Jesus I want to come with that one talent I want to make myself available to you you said you're not gonna discard of me you're going to actually take me and use me I want you to use me now and I submit my talent to you if that is your decision I'm gonna invite you to stand to your feet you're saying Jesus I am willing to be used by you the theme of this message was touch by a child when Joseph was touched by Jesus his life was completely transformed and I'm not here to tell you that it's going to be smooth for you there's no prosperity preaching preacher right here but when you're touched by Jesus you may lose your friends some of your friends you may lose some of your income you may lose some of your prestige you may even lose your name Joseph was always laughed at throughout his entire career and even long after he was dead people laughed at him through his son and they said Jesus you're you're the one who has gotten uh, from 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 some other father and they laughed at Jesus and Joseph would have heard that all through his life following Jesus doesn't mean that everybody likes you following Jesus doesn't mean that your life becomes smooth but following Jesus does mean you have an eternal reward awaiting you following Jesus means that you are esteemed in the eyes of heaven is there someone today who is hearing the message I need to be I need to allow Jesus to come into my life I need to allow him to touch me and I'm willing to I'm prepared to to follow him I'm willing to accept him and to move as he moves me I'm willing to be used by him if it is your desire to open your heart to Jesus that he may touch you I invite you to come forward this is now you want a relationship with him you want to move forward with him. your desire maybe you've never accepted him as your Lord and Savior but today you're saying Jesus I want you to touch me if you can touch Joseph if you can touch your disciples if you can touch all these individuals back in scripture I believe you can touch my life as well if you want him to touch you I invite you to come forward praise be to God I made God bless you, I made a decision to follow Jesus at the age of eight he touched me I'm glad he touched me at that age because just like the son is saying I've never been the same again and I've walked with him and I've seen him at work in my life 
I've seen him work on the rough edges in my life. But the beautiful thing is, and, and this is a wonderful thing, Pastor Barton, we can say, he's still working on me. He's making our lives smoother. He's still in our lives, moving, moving. Oh, yes. This carpenter says, I'm not going to finish until my job is complete in your life. So you may have been baptized 20, 30, 40 years ago. That's good and commendable. But Jesus says, I'm going to bring you to the place I want you to. And I'm going to keep on chiseling, sanding you down until you become in my hands that object of great joy and pride. If you've hardened your heart to Jesus as a member, you went through something terrible in your life, but you hardened yourself. You said, I can't believe God allowed that to happen to me. And you kind of became bitter with the carpenter in heaven. I want to encourage you right now with these words that though he allows you to pass through some trials and though it will bruise you and though you may be hurt it doesn't mean that he has abandoned you he has never let go of you and he understands those moments when you're crying and tears are coming down he's there he's seen everything his heart hurts but he's saying to you don't give up you can't quit yet I'm almost through with bringing you to where I need you to be. This is not the day nor the hour to quit. This is a time to keep on going and finish the task. So I'm speaking to members. I'm speaking to those who are experienced in the faith. If today you just want to recommit yourself and say, God, I'm at this point in my walk with you. I don't want to give up. I'm not going to harden my heart anymore. I'm going to forgive those who have hurt me because that's going to hold me back if I don't forgive. And I'm going to trust you with all my heart. If that is where you are, I want to trust him with this issue in my life. You can either raise your hand if you can't come forward or you can walk forward. We just want to pray with you in a special way right now. It's a beautiful thing to, to see what you can do and have done and will do in the lives of men and women, boys and girls who are touched by you. You've said in your word that you stand at our heart's door and you knock. If we open that door, the Bible says you will come in and will sup commune with us God in order for us to be changed we have to allow you entrance into our lives when Gabriel announced to Joseph the plan of God Joseph could have said I don't want anything to do with this plan I'm turning my back on Mary. I'm turning my back on Jesus. He would not have experienced the wonderful miracle of having the Son of God in his life. So today, God, if there's someone who has been hesitant to open that door to you, remind them of Joseph. Remind them of the big dream that you have for them. Help them to open that door wide so that you can come in and bring a transformative work in their lives. Then there are those who have stood up 
from their feet to say, Lord, that they, they want to be touched by you. They're those who have, who have walked forward to say they want a relationship with you or they, or they want a renewed walk with you. God, we are so grateful and thankful for the decisions made in this church today. Oh God, I pray that you'll honor each decision. We're, we're not perfect and we understand that. There are flaws in us. We, people know of our mistakes and we know of our mistakes and the devil reminds us of our mistakes so often. But today, you're the God who says, if we confess our sins, you're faithful and you're just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You're the God who says, listen, when I forgive you, I take your sins and throw them into the bottom of the ocean. I don't swim after them anymore. I don't look at it anymore. I don't remember those sins. I look upon you and see the precious blood of Jesus covering you. And God, that gives us assurance today that in spite of our faults, you're willing to work with us. And God, I'm praying that this will be a taste of heaven. Let it be that when you come again and receive us into your kingdom, that God, we can look at each other and see the handiwork of God in our lives. For in heaven, we will celebrate your workmanship. We will celebrate your craftsmanship. We will celebrate your goodness in our lives for time and eternity. Until then, encourage our hearts, strengthen our spirit, and help us, O oh God, to finish what we have begun. If we should die in this world, let us die like Paul did, saying, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. If you, O oh God, should come in our lifetime, let us hear the words from your lips. Well done. We want to finish what we have begun. And we thank you for the privilege and the joy of knowing that you're working in our lives. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for hearing us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.